WHO reports that non-communicable diseases cause 74% of deaths globally. And whilst a lot of these are coming from middle and low income countries, it is a very serious global problem and problem here as well in Cayman. So what do I mean by saying data-driven prevention? Well, we're looking to reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases um, in our population to reduce premature deaths, but also to improve people's quality of life, to enable fuller participation in the workforce, and to allow um, more active years with loved ones. And individuals will often have multiple risk factors for non-communicable diseases. So the first thing is really important for us to understand is the prevalence of these risk factors to then know how we can reduce the risk factors to then also reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases. And what we do this in our field of collating and monitoring data is called surveillance. Um, and it, at its core, it's simply about information for action. So here, we're looking to understand the prevalence of non-communicable disease and the prevalence of the risk factors for those non-communicable diseases. And to do that, we need to have timely, accurate, and representative data of the population. We can then use this information to inform our interventions to make sure they're reaching the people um, that are most at risk. Um, and it also enables us to monitor and evaluate how effective those interventions are. So what is the current situation for non-communicable diseases in the Cayman Islands? Well, we have a variety of different data sources that all fit together and provide some different pieces to the puzzle, albeit maybe not a complete picture at this stage. And so I'm going to talk through each of those and what we know and what, what that information tells us. So first of all, the STEP survey. This is a survey designed by the World Health Organization. And it looks to um, estimate the prevalence of risk factors for non-communicable diseases and estimate the prevalence of some non-communicable diseases in the population by doing a questionnaire and asking people to answer questions about their behavior, but also taking some measurements and gathering those objective measures too. It was done in the Cayman Islands in 2012, so just over 10 years ago. And here's some of the information that it revealed at the time. 15% of the population were smokers, 70% were overweight or obese, and 37% were obese. 26% had raised blood pressure, um, and those individuals were on medication. 15% had raised blood pressure but were not receiving medication at the time, and that's a clear point where we can have public health action to ensure that people who have conditions are receiving the right care and treatment that they need. 54% of the population were not engaging in vigorous exercise. And when I was talking about earlier with multiple risk factors occurring in individuals, among a younger age group of those 25 to 44-year-olds, 39% had three or more risk factors. And among an older population of 45 to 64 years, 49% had more than three risk factors. Now, this is a very helpful source of data. It takes a random sample from the population, which means these findings can then be representative of the whole population. And as I mentioned, it has both the self-reported behavioral aspects, but also the objective measures that we can put alongside that. Another source of data that we have is mortality data, and I've got that here from 2019. And this tells us the leading causes of death among residents in the population. And as you can see, those are uh, mostly co contributed by disease of the circulatory system and then cancer alongside also diseases of the respiratory system. And this is a really helpful data source to understand what is causing mortality in your population, particularly if you can also look at younger ages to see what's causing premature death. Um, but what it doesn't tell us is about any other comorbidities that those individuals have. So we don't have the full picture of morbidity in the population by looking at this. We can just see what is the overall cause of death. The Cayman Islands census that was recently conducted is a very important source of demographic data and enables us in public health to be able to produce rates of disease. So it provides us the denominator of the number of people in the population overall, but also among different subgroups, different age groups, so that we can say what the rate of disease is among those age groups. There was also a question included in the recent survey about medically diagnosed illness relating to disability. Um, and this gives some insights about what individuals self-reported that was um, often causing them difficulty to engage in daily activities. 
for example, diabetes, arthritis, and cataracts. Um, but as this question is particularly relating to disability and of how the question was applied, this is not something that we can use to say this is the prevalence of those um, conditions in the population. Thinking a bit more about mental health, we have two sources of data that we have currently in the Cayman Islands that give us some idea. Uh, the first is the Mental Health Commission annual report, and this looks at the number of individuals who um, have been admitted to the hospital unit with a primary diagnosis of suffering from a serious mental illness. And this was around 60 individuals in 2020, which was quite similar to the year before. But this is obviously individuals who have quite serious mental illness. And we don't currently have any estimates for the population as a whole for more common mental illnesses, for example, anxiety or depression. Um, and that's a gap that would be great to fill. We do, however, have um, a report from the National Drug Council. They've done a survey among students looking at drug use, and in their previous survey in 2020, they included a question about mental health. And this revealed that of students, 32% reported seeing a doctor, a nurse, or a counselor in the past year about their mental health, and 13% had gone to see one of these individuals between two and five times in the last year. When asked about um, how they described their mental or emotional health on the day, 18% said that it was excellent, but 11% described it to be poor. And uh, one question that was particularly about medically diagnosed mental health illnesses revealed that 12% of individuals had ever been diagnosed. Um, however, again, from this, we can't draw prevalence or incidence estimates because this is across their whole lifetime being ever diagnosed and doesn't give any further breakdown. So it gives some indication, but there are a few pieces of information still missing here. And the last data source I'll speak to is the Cancer Registry, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. It's a voluntary registry here for cancer survivors who can choose to opt in and provide their information. And in 2021, there were 86 individuals who registered, which was a little lower than previous years, likely linked to the COVID restrictions. 48 of those were diagnosed that year. However, as this is voluntary, we know that that will be a sizable underestimate of the individuals who were diagnosed with cancer in 2021. Looking at the data in the registry across the years since it was started, um, we have an idea of the most reported cancers among male registrants. This was prostate cancer, followed by cancers of the blood and colon cancer. And for female registrants, it was breast cancer, followed by, again, colon cancer and cancers of the blood. As this doesn't capture all cancer um, cases or patients in the Cayman Islands, again, we're unable to say what the prevalence or incidence is. Um, and as individuals choose to come forward, rather than being, I guess, randomly selected from all cancer patients, some of this data, it's hard to know whether it would be representative of all patients in the population. So what are we doing going forwards for the surveillance of non-communicable diseases to address some of the gaps that I've highlighted? Well, firstly, we're looking to repeat the STEP survey. As I mentioned, this was a really helpful source of data that has been referred back to many times in the past decade, and we'd love to update those figures to see what's changed since 2012 and what the current status of the population is. We're also looking to have a stronger focus on step three, one of the parts of the survey, which collects um, biochemical measurements, looking at things like blood glucose and total cholesterol. Secondly, we're also looking to have a non-communicable disease registry, and this is a project that's already underway. If you think about some of the data sources I spoke to, none of them actually gather data directly from healthcare facilities about medically diagnosed um, non-communicable diseases. So this is a really important data source that we need to be looking at more, and that's something that we're starting to do. Currently collecting data on diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, COPD, hypertension, and obesity. Currently, this is just looking at patients within HSA, but this can be reviewed in the future. I'm going to give now an example of um, what, we, what I mean with data-driven prevention and how using some of the data that we have available can guide our thinking. One data source I didn't speak to was the Child Health Program, and this is where we can look at obesity among school-aged children. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the School Health Program here. Um, it performs screening to enable early detection and treatment of health issues among children that will hopefully prevent them from impacting on their education. It's offered to all schools and occurs at school entry as well as uh, year six and then any new arrivals to the island. 
And some of the measurements that are taken include weight and heights, which means that body mass index can be calculated, a reliable indicator of body fat. And for children and teens, this is done on, on an age sex specific basis. So I'm just gonna present the data from the last five available years, which is the academic year of 2017-18 up to academic year 22-23. We don't have data, you might note, for 2020-21, and this is due to COVID restrictions of data not being gathered that year. What this chart shows is, over time, how the proportion of children um, in entry grade, so children that are four to six years old, um, are either underweight, which is the blue bars that you can see, healthy weight, which is the green bars, or overweight or obese, which is shown in the orange bars. Just below the chart, you'll see the sample size that was in each of these year groups. And you can see we've got a fairly healthy sample size of around three to 400 children. And from looking at, at this data over the five years, there isn't a clear trend in these proportions changing. You will see in 2021 to 22, there's a slight increase in the proportion of children that are overweight, obese. And then in 22, 23, the blue bar is a little bit higher from previous years of a higher proportion that are underweight. Just to give some of the most recent data, in 22-23, so you can see these prevalences, 30% were underweight, 44% a healthy weight, and 26% overweight or obese. And giving that breakdown of the last category, 13% were overweight and 14% obese. Comparing this to year six students as they finish primary school, Again, we've got a very similar format of the same chart, although you will note at the bottom the sample size is very different here, ranging from 12 up to 44 students in those age groups. So we have to have a degree of caution on how we interpret the trends that are shown here. But what I think is interesting that you can see, albeit the small sample sizes, is that the orange bars show quite a clear trend of the prevalence of obesity in overweight children increasing over this five-year time frame. Again, just to give the most recent figures, for 22, 23, 28% were underweight, 31% healthy weight, and 41% overweight or obese, which is broken down to be 25% overweight and 16% obese. So what does this all mean? What are the takeaway messages from this? Well, children entering school right now, one in four of them, 26%, are either overweight or obese, and then by the time they leave primary school, it, this has increased to one in 2.4 children, or 41%. And we know that obesity among children has many implications for them, both um, physically and behaviorally. We know that they can then experience things like stigma and bullying at school, which may impact their low self-esteem, may impact on their school presence, and also has physical impacts in terms of high cholesterol, is associated with high blood pressure, and other issues. It also is more common for individuals who are obese when they're a child to also um, be overweight when they're adults, and this can lead to other health issues. So what can we do? Well, I think the first takeaway here is that prevention needs to be throughout the life course. We need to start very early on, and um, the school, whilst it's not responsible for reducing ob obesity, has a key role that it can play here, where we can introduce interventions to try and tackle this. There are some that have been used in different places. Often this is around education, increasing child's daily physical activity, and looking at what food choice there is and, and providing healthy eating within the school. There was recently a review of interventions done in a number of different primary schools in a region of the UK, and what they found was that where education alone is provided, this can impact on the child's motivation, but doesn't actually lead to a change in the outcome of their BMI measure at the end of the two-year window. But when it's combined with both an increase in daily physical activity and in the um, healthy eating choices that are available, that this can lead to a change in the BMI outcome measure of obese children at those schools. The other interesting thing was that there wasn't always a change seen in the dietary choices by the children from these interventions. And I think what they took away from that was that the school is just one place where there are influences on these children and actually they're backing up what the child is learning in the community and at home. And what that leads us to is we need to have system-wide approaches that go across organizations, across communities, across families, and across individuals. And looking at other countries, there have been 
interventions or um, approaches put in place across the food industry to look at how we can label food better to show what is the content of that food and give people more information when they're making choices about what they eat. There have been reductions in sugar content in food and regulations put around that. There have also been changes made in environment to encourage activity, to provide more cycle lanes and things like this, but also looking at land use around particular public areas. Are there fast food outlets near school gates? And what kind of impact is that having um, on those children? Media and advertising is another big one, and there have been moves looking at how we can reduce what is shown about foods that have high salt or high sugar content on children's channels and try and regulate that to limit the influences that are less helpful for them in making these choices. And ultimately, healthcare professionals, you are key in, in this moving forwards to promote healthy and positive messages and support your patients in making those decisions. One other thing to mention is that obesity and deprivation have been shown to have a clear association. This is taken from data in the UK in 2018 and 2019. And you'll see in the green bars, which is the year six data, and in the red bars, which is the reception data, this shows across from the most deprived decile, so 10% of the population, along to the least deprived. And you can see a clear association there that the most deprived have the highest prevalence of obesity. And this is as much as twice the prevalence of obesity that is in the least deprived decile. And this is something that I'm sure is not the case only in the UK. So to close, I hope the example that I've shown of obesity and how we can use data to inform our decisions shows the importance it is to have the timely, accurate, and representative data about the prevalence of chronic diseases and those risk factors for us to be able to make the helpful decisions for the health of our future generations and generation in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rachel. Certainly some information there that's giving us all reason to pause and consider uh, what you have mentioned. Now, I will just repeat, those of you who need to go into the hall for any reason, we do ask that you be mindful that there are presentations being made and to keep your conversation levels to a minimum. Thank you in advance for that. Now, our next speaker is Fiona McDougall. She's the owner and director of Healthy Futures Limited. We're very excited to hear from her. As an executive level healthcare consultant with over 20 years experience, her presentation tonight on managing chronic diseases will provide insights on demographic and socioeconomic factors and innovative chronic disease management models that will help to improve patient outcomes. Let's welcome Fiona. Excellent, thank you, and good evening. It's lovely to see so many of you here this, uh, this evening and such a great turnout for this event. Um, I'm very pleased to share the stage with uh, colleagues, and thank you, Ms. Corbett, that was a wonderful presentation, Professor Ian Cumming. Um, so we've got a lot to look forward to with this conference. Um, so I won't dwell on my early slides too much because our Minister of Health and Wellness has already provided some details on chronic disease management. Um, so I'll provide a little bit of detail in terms of background there. And then what I'd like to do is actually move into the context here in the Cayman Islands. What does this mean for us specifically looking at our census data and also looking at our CPI data as well, the Consumer Price Index? And then I'll move into some models on chronic disease management, healthcare system models, and then we can talk about some opportunities uh, that that brings, things we can build on here in the Cayman Islands. So, real quickly, as I said, I won't go into too much details. The World Health Organization data has been presented. We know there is a significant prevalence of chronic diseases globally, and they really fall into those four big buckets of cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes. Um, importantly, many of chronic, the chronic diseases can be prevented through awareness and reduction of risk factors. So as Ms. Corbett had highlighted, chronic disease risk factors fall into three broad buckets. 
So the first bucket being non-modifiable factors. So those are things like your age, your gender, your genetics, family history, ethnicity. The next bucket, modifiable behaviors. Um, and we know behavior is difficult to change. <laughs> and in some environments, it's easier than it is in others. So if these are things like choosing to smoke or not smoke, how much alcohol is consumed, the type of nutrition uh, that we have access to, and exercise, physical activity. The third bucket are the social determinants of health. Um, and see, these are things that we might not always think of as important, um, but as a member of the Mental Health Commission um, and recognizing the relationship and correlation between chronic disease and mental health and social determinants of health, these are things that are critically important. We're thinking about cultural norms, environmental, fac environmental factors like pollution, uh, equity, and our economic environment. So if we drill down and look at some of the data, so this data here that I'm sharing is demographic data from the United States first. So in terms of prevalence, what are some of the trends that we can understand with respect to risk factors? So in terms of non-modifiable risk factors, our age. As much as we would like to, we can't stop the clock. <laughs> so we do know that with increased age, as we see in the first chart, so the first chart is showing in the teal bars those age 55 to 64, and then in the gray bars, the second cohort, which is the age 65 plus. And we can see the prevalence of chronic diseases, one or more chronic conditions, two plus chronic conditions, three plus. And as we age, we see the prevalence increases. And that is something that happens globally. In the second chart that you see there, we're looking at the uh, gender, the sex, and ethnicity considerations and factors. Again, non-modifiable. And so what we do see, some things that stand out, in the teal bars, we're looking at one chronic condition, the gray bars, two or more chronic conditions. So when we look between male and female, we see that for multiple chronic conditions, the prevalence is higher in females. When we look at our ethnicity, we see that non-Hispanic whites also have a higher prevalence in terms of multiple chronic conditions and much lower in Asian and Hispanic populations. If we move to the other bucket of modifiable behavioral risk factors, so smoking in and of itself, consuming alcohol, exercise, nutrition, those don't directly correlate to disease. What they do is they contribute to four key metabolic factors. And this is really important to understand because it's the metabolic factors that actually increase the risk of chronic disease. And what's critically important is we think about the top metabolic changes that can happen, elevated blood pressure, being over overweight or obese, uh, hyperglycemia, that's your high blood glucose levels, or your hyper hyperlipidemia, which is high levels of fat in the blood. So the number one leading metabolic change factor that is attributed to death in chronic disease is in fact elevated blood pressure. And this is critical, as our governor said in his opening remarks, the silent killer. We don't necessarily know. High blood pressure is something that needs to be monitored from a clinical standpoint. It doesn't necessarily present to our own sort of sensation. So that's important to understand. And then, as a member of the Mental Health Commission, I would be remiss if I did not mention the importance of that correlation, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to chronic diseases and mental health disorders. Um, so we know social, economic, and environmental factors all contribute to a person's health. And when we think about a person's health, it's physical health and it's mental health. It's the whole person, right? It is a person-centered approach to care that we need to think about. And so we know that people with chronic diseases actually have higher rates of mental health disorders, and at the same time, people with mental health disorders have greater risks of developing chronic diseases. So there is a relationship there, and it is a cyclical relationship that reinforces. So that's important to understand. So let's take a look at our Cayman context. Um, so we are blessed to have recently received the report in July of this year from our census data. Um, so we'll jump into our census data, and we'll also look at our consumer price index, because the world has changed dramatically over the past few years from an economic standpoint. So what's interesting from our census with respect to the Cayman population age demographics? So the first chart 
looks at the percentage of growth by age group. Now remember, the last census was 2010, and then we did the most recent census in 2021. So this is an 11-year time period. So what do we see? If we look at that first graph, the age 65 plus, so that age cohort of 65 plus, virtually doubled. 98% increase in the last 11 years. So that's a massive increase. So in terms of raw numbers, we're talking about uh, 2,800, so 2,800 people, but now we've got 5,600 seniors. Huge implications for making sure that we have the services in place in the community, in primary care, to support that growing aging population. The next largest area of growth in the last 11 years in the age 50 to 64. So the next cohort, a much larger cohort. Now we're talking about what used to be 8,000 people in that age bracket to now 14,000 people. Um, so they are going to continue <laughs> to age, and they are a very big wave. And if we look at the other graph to the side, this is the Cayman population pyramid. This is not a normalized distribution, the way I've displayed this, because what we're looking at here in the gray is the percentage of non-Caymanian persons in each of these age cohorts, and in the teal are Caymanian populations. So why is that important from our census data? I'm assuming our Caymanians love living here and intend to retire here. So they're not leaving the island. Where we see a lot of the residents who are perhaps here on work permits who don't necessarily intend to retire here in the gray, they tend to be in the younger population, 30 to 49. That's the, the working force age. Um, but the vast majority of our older population are our Caymanians who are gonna stay. So that's material when we think about making sure we've got the services in place, whether it's transportation, housing, healthcare, community support, so people can age gracefully in their homes, surrounded by their family. So what else did we see in the census? This is actually some good information, some exciting information, when we look at education and employment. And why is this important? It's important because it bodes well for health education and health literacy. So what we see in the first graph, which is the highest educational attainment, our data from 2010 is in the teal, and then we can see that in the gray data, 2021, we've got an increase in the percentage of the adult population who have achieved a higher level of education. So the Cayman Islands is becoming a higher educated population, so that sounds, that's really good for health literacy. Um, healthcare providers, beware. Um, Professor Ian Cumming has warned you that your patients are going to come in well informed, they're going to have done their research, and they'll have a lot of questions. Um, but that's good because that means they're interested in taking care of their health and we'll learn a bit later that uh, self-care when it comes to chronic disease management is critically important. In the second chart, we're also seeing over time, the last 11 years, an increase in the percent of the population that's earning in the highest two brackets of income, so greater than 57,000. So we've seen a 9%, right? So what went from 20% in 2010 in the teal of individuals, adults earning 57,000 or higher is now a 9% increase to 29%. That's good, but I caution, because this is not adjusted for inflation, which brings me to my next slide. So if we have a look at the rising cost of living. So we do know that inflation has been rising across the globe. Since the onset of the pandemic, supply chain challenges, workforce challenges, we have seen massive increases in inflation and it's not stopped yet. It hasn't fully corrected. The implications for health are not insignificant. So I'm giving you a couple of examples here. First chart from our CPI data. So this is the most recent data. This is uh, looking at the annual change from 2021 to 2022, and this is taken from the report in the month of July. So what we're seeing in the food, if you look in the first chart, is that the healthiest food products, our meat and our fish and seafood and vegetables, double-digit increases, right? If we look on the far end of that chart, the sugar, confectionery, snacks, oils and fats, these have not increased all that much. So when I go shopping and I've got my basket and I have my budget, all of a sudden I'm unable to afford the same amount of the healthy food. And in fact, 
when I look at what I can afford, I'm going to fill my basket potentially more with the sugars, the confectionaries, the snacks, because that's much more affordable, and I'm filling my basket fuller than what I can with, you know, quite frankly, a nine, do nine CI dollars for a cauliflower. That's what it was on the weekend when I went to go shopping. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's, that's serious in terms of thinking about nutrition here in the Cayman Islands, um, but also in the Caribbean as a whole, and I'll talk about that in a little uh, next slide a bit deeper. Um, but the other factor to consider, too, is when we think about modifiable risks, as we've talked about, so what nutrition, what food we choose, it's not always our choice if we can't afford the healthy cho cho choose, to choose the healthy food. Um, it's the same with our physical activity. So when we look at the next chart, this actually shows um, all of the baskets, if you will, that are included in the CPI calculation. And um, we know that the first few items there, housing, water, utilities, transports, these are not discretionary options. We can't choose to no longer spend on our housing and our utilities, so we have to lay that money out. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, alcoholic beverages and tobacco sometimes considered stress relievers, but at the same time, we know they're not healthy, but we haven't seen the prices go up there. There's fewer deterrents there, and yet we're out of pocket with our non-discretionary spending. In the category of recreation and culture, if you drill down into that category in our CPI data, one of the things that was interesting is the subset of um, recreation and sporting services, so going into a gym or buying equipment, has increased year over year 26% which is phenomenal, right? So we think about expensive healthy food, that's risen double digits. We think about access to educational or exercise facilities and recreation, also double digits. So when we drill a little bit more into nutrition, why is it so expensive to get healthy food? So this is not just something that impacts Cayman. This is something that across the Caribbean is significant, and we've seen the obesity rates that um, Ms. Corbett just presented there, and so that's consistent with the STEP survey that we've seen, that the prevalence of obesity in the Cayman Islands and in the Caribbean is greater than 35%. That's actually similar to the United States, but it is significantly higher than Canada and the UK and Australia. Um, but what are the factors? Why is this the case in the Caribbean? So we're seeing these diet-related diseases associated with a decline in the consumption of locally produced foods and a significant increase in the food imports to the Caribbean islands. So over a 20-year period, so the data here is looking at a period from 1990 to 2011, we saw a 20% increase, so from less than 45% to over 67% of the food that came to the Caribbean islands was imported. And on this ship <laughs> that I've shown here, the vast majority of that food that gets imported is processed food. Processed food and then followed by dairy, meat, wheat, and corn. These are calorie-dense, ultra-processed, and in many cases, nutritionally poor imports of food. And as we saw in our CPI data, cheaper in the grocery stores. So this is problematic. So it's difficult to say, well, let's just modify behavior and what you choose to eat when you're limited with your funds, when we're dealing with the economics that we are in the past few years. And then similarly, as I mentioned, the cost that's risen to access recreational facilities you know, and fitness facilities and equipment. There are other considerations with respect to physical activity. Again, we'd like to choose to do physical activity as much as possible, but in the Cayman Islands, it's not the same as the rest of North America. We are dealing with very hot temperatures throughout most of the day. That's a challenge. We know that to go to an indoor facility is very expensive. It's got air conditioning, but it's very expensive. Um, we lack sort of the terrain and, and the seasonality. We don't have mountains that we can run up, and we don't have shade everywhere. Um, we have seen some additional investments, thankfully, from government and from other um, private providers with public amenities, but we probably need to see more of these at our beaches, where we do have access to go swimming and be outdoors. Um, road safety is a critical one if we think about biking. Um, so we're seeing along West Bay Road, 
we're seeing the bike paths added, which is wonderful, and seeing that expanded across the island would help for people to uptake the cycling. Because you can cycle to work in the morning when it's a bit cooler, at the end of the day when it's a bit cooler, but road safety is a valid concern. Um, in addition, because the cost of living closer to Georgetown or closer to Kamana Bay is very expensive, people are choosing to live further out or may just not necessarily by choice, but choose to have to live further out because of how much their dollar can spread. So that means they're spending a lot more time in traffic, right? So that rush hour. So then your window in the morning when it's cooler, in the evening when it's cooler, picking up the kids, getting everyone out. If you wanna go walk the beach at night, it's very difficult to do that after you've spent an hour in traffic just to get home, make dinner, and get everything organized. And then lastly, as we said, the equipment to do sports like golf. We do have lots of golf courses on island, but it is very expensive to actually get out there, get the equipment, get the, all the kids, pay the, de the dues to get onto the course. Um, so these are all factors that are challenging as much as we want to be physically active. So <laughs> let's move forward now. There are lots of uh, health system and social system considerations and opportunities that we can look at to address this. So I'll talk next about some of the health system models, um, broadly speaking. So Professor Ian Cumming has spoke quite a bit about the cost of care. Um, and if we think about our health human resources, how we organize our care, if we hear uh, what Ms. Corbett mentioned about disease registries, there are things that we can do to start getting more information about how we can transform what that future is going to look like. So I'll delve a little bit more into some of our chronic disease management models. Um, so, context. The healthcare system has changed dramatically sort of post-World War II, when everything was sort of focused on acute care. So when we think about healthcare system, what are we moving from? We are moving from reactive, acute, to where we need to go with respect to our population growth and chronic disease, which is to planned and population-based care. So that's just an overall overarching context to understand. And then over the past few decades, there have been a lot of research, a lot of studies done with respect to healthcare system models. Uh, Value-based care, I'll get into a little more detail on and talk a little bit about the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the IHI's triple, quadruple, and quintuple aim, touching on a lot of the topics uh, related to the quality of care as well as the cost of care. And then, diving a little further, I'll talk about three chronic disease management models and importantly, what are some of the factors that need to be in place for those models to be successful? Because we do see positive patient outcomes when we apply these models, and there's a lot of research behind that. So, quickly jumping into healthcare system models. Um, so I'm gonna present two. So the first one, as I mentioned, is the value-based care model. Um, so for those of us who, who maybe went to business school or in the consulting industry, this is the Porter uh, model. So this is Michael Porter, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, who worked extensively with clinicians, with policy advisors, with researchers, um, and he took his expertise from looking at businesses in, in the U.S. and globally and said, how can we apply it to the really easy business model that is healthcare, <laughs> knowing that it is literally one of the most complex business models that exists. And so he came up with a simple math equation, if you will. And his concept, because it's value-based care, revolves around value. So when we think about value, it's an equation. So at the top of that equation, to get a positive value, that's what we want to get. Positive value is that the, the, we have a, a numerator and a denominator. We want our numerator, the check mark there, which is the outcomes, and patient experience. So that quality part of the equation needs to be high. And then ideally, to get that quality, the direct cost and the indirect cost, our dollar sign underneath, needs to be lower. That will give us a positive value. Um, it's not just as easy as an equation, though. You can see there are six uh, variables, factors that need to be considered. You know, how do we organize care around the medical conditions. We need to understand those medical conditions and apply the appropriate clinically valid care. We need to measure outcomes and costs, so that's important, how we measure things. 
um, and aligning reimbursement with Valley. Probably one of the trickiest changes to be done is how do we reimburse healthcare providers, healthcare systems, health insurers to provide care in a way that drives quality, that drives value, not just volume. Um, we need to look at systems integration. So how do we ensure that as we transition from primary care, secondary care, tertiary acute care, community care, that as folks are transitioning through all these points of care, we know that the points of transitions are also the, the most common points of failure. So integrating our systems is critical. The geography of care, where we provide care, where we can access care, um, and there's an equity component there. And underlying all of this is obviously information technology to make this happen. So this model was developed in 2006. Around the same time, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, came out with kind of a similar model, and, and there is some crossover between the folks who are working on this. Um, it started out in 2007 as a triple aim. And if we look at what the components of the triple are, the three triple things, the three things, improved patient experience, sounds familiar, better outcomes, so those clinical quality outcomes, and lower costs. But in 2014, it became the quadruple aim. So it's almost as if they foresaw this health human resource crisis <laughs> that we're having, particularly post-pandemic. So back in 2014, they added clinician well-being, so our healthcare providers, as part of that equation. If we have healthy, happy healthcare providers, folks who want to stay in the business, who want to continue providing care. That's an important part of our equation. And then more recently in 2021, a quintuple aim, so the fifth element was added for consideration, and this is health equity. So this is recognizing that not everyone in our population has access to the same level of care, whether it's because of insurance and limitations in insurance, if you're on a SHIC plan or a premium plan, or because of the neighborhood you live in, you know, I have uh, one client in, in Canada where they've got an entire part of a city uh, that isn't as prosperous as other parts of the city, and they've got an aging um, healthcare provider population, and GPs are retiring, but we can't attract new GPs to come in, and they're rostered patients, so now all of a sudden a retirement happens, an office closes, and you've got 2,000 patients without a GP. Right? So these things are happening. So health equity is a real thing that's now been added into the equation for consideration. So highlights for these models, really it's around the quality, the process quality, the experience of the patient, and the clinical outcomes. And then on the other side, it's looking at payment models. So fee for service, which is a, a fee at every interaction, every piece of service, does tend to drive volume because it's not necessarily tied to an outcome. You're not holding back as you would perhaps with somebody who is replacing your roof. I'm not gonna give you any money until this full roof is done and there's demonstrated there's no leaks. It's I'm not paying you for every shingle, I'm paying you for a roof that doesn't leak. That's where we start to move into capitation models where maybe we have some roofs that are easy to fix and some roofs that are more difficult to fix, but on an annual basis, maybe we pay you a certain amount per person in that population, and your job as the clinician is to put in as little or as much effort as required to keep that part of the population healthy, and you get paid for that. So if it doesn't take a lot of effort because you're using things like education and, and you know, self-management, and you're using IT, and you're enabling and using, you know, alternative resources to support that patient's health, then that's a way that everybody in the system wins. You have a healthy patient, you've got quality of care, and you've also got a robust uh, economic side of the equation. And then there's also value-based care. It's a similar type concept, but it's applied to more of a, a bundled episode of care, like a hip replacement, for example. A hip replacement, as it moves through all the transitions in care from the primary care, the evaluation, through to pre-surgery, and then you know the actual surgery post-surgical op, you know, transitioning down to weight bearing back to the community. That full episode of care might have a price tag to it. And those providers who can provide that care with the highest quality, you know, not coming back to hospital for, you know, post, you know, uh, incision infections, all those things, quality of care will be able to make sure that everybody wins, the patient and the provider. So those are the high level models. 
If we drill down, and I, this is a wordy slide, I'm going to warn you, so we're not going to go through every word, um, but if anybody would like the details after, I'm happy to provide it. But drilling down to some of these concepts with what our researchers and collaborators have looked at with chronic disease management models, a lot of the features that I've just shared on those system models also show up here for chronic disease management models. They are particularly applicable. So the first model, which is a disease management program, is a specialist model that focuses on a specific chronic condition. So it's targeting patients in a population that maybe have diabetes. So maybe we set up a diabetes clinic. And then we build the care around that. So we establish the clinical practice guidelines. We, ha we build a collaborative model with nurses, with allied healthcare, with dietitians, um, pharmacists, other team members. We focus on self-education and self-management. And we focus on the outcomes, the costs, the utilization, the health outcomes. So there's promise in that model. But take it further, because we know that as the population ages and we're dealing with chronic conditions, we're actually looking at multiple chronic conditions. So how do we then deal with, instead of setting up and sending our patient to four different independent clinics for all their multiple conditions, we need to think about a population-based model uh, that might be based in primary care that can address multiple chronic conditions. And this is the chronic care model. And so these models have been in development since sort of the mid-90s, and there's been tons of research to further adapt them and grow them as the systems move forward. Um, so there are some similarities to our disease management uh, programs, particularly with the self-management support, but this focuses and leverages more data data, decision support, clinical support systems, so that we're proactive, we're focused on prevention, we're looking at risk factors, we're reorganizing our healthcare organizations, and importantly, we're tapping into community resources. Again, as our population ages, they want to age within their communities, with their neighbors, with their family. Um, so those community resources, you know, things like Meals on Wheels, community centers, educations become really important. And then the last one, which is actually focused on a, an older population. So now if we look at our older adults with multiple chronic conditions, again, a model based in primary care and in the community, and in this case also using a lot of cost-effective resources like RNs, we can help keep our older populations healthy. So the principles here, similar to a few of the other ones that we just saw, disease management, self-management, but add to that case management, transitional care, thinking about, because we know our older populations are going to utilize more resources, transitioning between care, and then importantly, caregiver support. The underappreciated informal caregivers, those sons, those daughters, those neighbors who help to care for our aging population, um, they are underappreciated. And as our health human resource crisis grows, as our health human resources, many of whom are boomers, are retiring and leaving, it is leaving gaps and we need to support our aging population. So this is high level, three models, happy to discuss um, in further detail anyone who's interested. But the next slide really just kind of focuses where do we need to go in the future, leveraging some of the features of these models. And not all of these features are easy. So it's important to say that our foundation in terms of chronic care models are really solid. There's a lot of studies, there are a lot of focus in these areas in terms of how can we inform future implementations. Because theory and research is not enough, we need to think about how we can practically adapt these models to work within our local systems. And our local systems have been established and entrenched. Our governance models, our funding models, these are things that are not easy to change. So this list that I will show you is kind of pull together what's common across our health system models and our various different disease management and chronic disease management models. So from one to 10 here, the ones at the top of the list are a little easier to implement in virtually any healthcare system. Right? So these are things we absolutely should be doing in the Cayman Islands. Um, and we are already doing, to be clear. This is not a huge gap, right? Evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. They're available everywhere. That's what our health human resources are trained on. We're in very good hands there. Patient self-management, also something that if we're not doing it extensively, is relatively easy to incorporate into our practices. Collaborative practice models, so working together across our community of caregivers, primary care, working with community, working with acute care, and then thinking about how we deliver that care as a system. 
So not just the people, but also our processes, how we transition care, and the technology that we use, right? So do we have disease registries? Do we have you know, identifiers for patients? Can we share information? Can we really provide wraparound care? So it starts to get a little more challenging from a, an operational implementation perspective if your system is fractured. We know most systems have elements of being fractured. There is no perfect healthcare system in the world. Right? If you read the, the Commonwealth um, uh, report recently out of healthcare systems, we know that nothing is perfect. Each system has its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, but things like decision support, a little more challenging. We need registries to do that, to be able to get our data together. Um, clinical information systems, they don't all talk to each other. That's a challenge. So now we've got pockets of data over here on a patient and siloed pockets over here on, a, on the same patient. It's not brought together. Um, caregiver education and support, you know, it's identifying those caregivers and making sure they have access to care um, and enabling those care transitions. That requires the information to do so. Um, and then the last two, probably the most challenging, healthcare system organization. So the overall governance of the system, the overall funding of the system. So moving, as we saw in the, in the health system models from Porter and, and IHI, and I'll, I'll highlight one from, from Kaiser Permanente in a second, but moving from you know, everything being fee for service to thinking about how can we move to value-based care that's about driving quality and outcomes or bundled care, those types of systems. And lastly, the monitoring of quality outcomes. So in the absence of data, in the absence of agreed upon quality measures, in the absence of decision support systems and clinical systems that work together, how can we actually monitor the quality outcome measures? And so that speaks to our quintuple aim across all of those elements. So if you're interested in further reading about where this is going in the future, one model that I didn't get into a lot of detail in, um, but it's an interesting case study, um, and this is the Kaiser Permanente. So they are um, a US-based nonprofit healthcare plan. I believe there's about nine or, or 12 million, 12 million members in the US who are part of this plan. So they were the, one of the earliest adopters of the chronic care model and the guided care model. So there's a lot of papers that they've published with respect to quality of care, care outcomes, and the cost of care. And so what they've realized is they study their population of patients, and they have the benefit of, you know, they're not a fee-for-service model. They are a closed system, if you will. So they have benefit of this population that they've been monitoring for decades um, as they age. And they realize that 5% of their population is, in fact, consuming 50% of their health care spend. So they said, all right, let's dive in and look more at this 5% of the population. So what did they see? If they focus on that 5% of the population, it sort of breaks down into a third, a third, a third of modifiable or we can't help, catastrophic, et cetera. So there's a lot more detail behind it, but what they've realized is that one area that they need to focus on is understanding that population that's up and coming, the rising risk population. So not just the 5%, because we can only really change the cost and quality outcomes for about a third, not if it's catastrophic incidences or they're already too deep into you know, chronic conditions, but the rising risk. So maybe it's our ages 50 to 64, that you know, 14,000 people who, who are coming down the pipe starting to get ahead of that. So. Lastly, this is my last couple of slides here, last slide actually, is if we think about building on some of this evidence here for opportunities in the Cayman Islands. So first of all, what can we do from a health system perspective? We can look at our health human resources. Are we utilizing the right health human resources? Do we have sufficient resources like nurses and educators in the system, uh, medical assistants? Do we have uh, programs that are wrapping care? The K-Health program out of HSA is a great example of a program that's focused in primary care, collaborative care with the community. So that's important. But we need to leverage technology, need to get the data, patient registries that were mentioned earlier, very excited to hear, chronic disease med uh, registry coming soon. So that's exciting. Um, so we've listed that there. And then thinking about our Cayman Islands seniors. Do we have a strategy for our seniors, right? What does that involve? Making sure that our seniors can live independently, at home, in their community, making sure that they have the financial, the housing, the health and physical security support. So those are critical factors. 
If we think about other areas in terms of policies and investments, we've already got some examples where for some of the things that uh, our population needs that we're getting expensive through inflation, um, there is an impact of duty cuts that can make things perhaps more affordable. Right? The Cayman Islands is growing in wealth, but the real issue is actually the distribution of that wealth. So if getting fresh fruits and vegetables is X percentage of somebody who's making 100, 200,000 a year, it's a significant percentage of somebody's income who's well below that $50,000 a year line. So that income distribution, maybe there's ways in which we can make the healthier foods, which have risen in terms of cost from our CPI data, more affordable to help people make those healthy choices, encourage them to make healthy choices. Um, we've got some great news with the legislation that's now been passed on lowering the uh, alcohol limit for driving. So not only will that, <laughs> yes, well done. Not only does that increase road safety, if we think about folks on their bikes in the early mornings or in the evenings, um, but you know there may be a wonderful spin-off benefit of, of lowering alcohol consumption altogether. We'll see that hopefully in our STEPS uh, survey in the future. And so other areas um, that we can look at, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are talking about the whole person. So when we think about person-centered care, where do those people hang out? The workplaces and the schools. So there's lots of opportunity in these environments where we can encourage healthy behaviors and healthy habits as well. Um, things like the four-day work week, some of the fringe benefits that we're learning from this experiment in the UK and in other jurisdictions is people are finding more time to exercise. They're finding more time to do stress reduction and spend with their family. Um, they're not in traffic all the time, hybrid models. So there are benefits to that. Um, so there's that, and then there's our children, as Ms. Corbett has highlighted. So in, in the circle of care, in the schools, the opportunities for education, um, the opportunities to ensure they're getting physical education. You know, here in the Cayman Islands, we're having our government who's provided free school lunches uh, in the schools for our public school system. So that's a way to increase the nutritional value of food that's going to our population of children. So these are all really wonderful things that we can build on. So looking at, you know, the evidence from the models elsewhere in other jurisdictions, we know we have some limitations being, you know, an island state, um, but there are opportunities from a health system, policy, and the environments in which we live and work that we can actually help the entire person and serve it as a patient, not just patient-centered, but person-centered care going forward. So. Thank you.